Okay, why don't we start? <laughs> it's good to be back at the monastery. It's good to see all of you. It's always good to come back, come back, back, back inside to our purpose because <clears throat> this world was made that we would forget our purpose. It's quite an extravagant world. It's has quite complexity, amazing detail. Uh, it's it's a generated world. It's a projected world, and and now we've reached the stage of human evolution where we have uh, movies. I just saw the recent uh, Mission Impossible movie with Tom Cruise, and it was all this time. Tom Cruise was pursuing as Ethan Hawke. Or Ethan, what's his name? Ethan Hunt. Ethan Hunt. Ethan Hawke's an actor. He was pursuing AI. AI was trying to take over the world, and he was going to have to hunt down AI. And and then there was a a character that was kind of acting on behalf of a uh, human character. But we look at this world, and there's we can see that movies replicate the world. We can see, we have animations, we can see things are being replicated and duplicated and multiplied at, at an enormously fast speed. And then the question comes back to your mind, like, hmm, what's it for me? What is the lesson in all of it? What is the end game. What is the ultimate purpose? I think that's a reasonable question. I think that's a question among questions that have been asked for centuries and centuries and centuries. And we have Jesus telling us pretty straight and leading us. We have mystics and saints, even modern day mystics like Thomas Merton who spent much of his life in the Abbey of Gethsemane there in Kentucky as a monk. And he would say things like, you know, basically, you know, a day without contemplation is a wasted day. Beautiful idea. And he was talking about contemplating God. Uh, if I'm not contemplating you, God, what am I doing? What am I using my mind for if I'm not contemplating you? If I'm not meditating on you, God, if I'm not praying to you, God, to help me, to offer me guidance and instruction, what am I actually doing with my mind's energy? It's a good question. That's a, that's a mystic for you. Uh, a day without contemplation is a wasted day. For the world, a day without making money is a wasted day. A, a day without serving bodies in some way, or serving the, the comforts and the conveniences and the future ambitions of the persons and the bodies, or trying to deny or hide or pretend something about the past, um, the guilt of the past, the heaviness of the past, it, it seems like a, a thick cloud, a burden. And our point is, I think one time I was giving a talk at the monastery years ago, but to be care, carefree, care, care, cared for, clueless. Oh, that's the most, I can't, I can't even remember the three things anymore. <laughs> too clueless. It's clueless, clueless. I remember my friend Lila was here and her eyes just lit up before she came to the monastery, to the community. She was in the corporate world, but she seemed to light up the most about those three ideas, especially the clueless idea. If you're coming, unwinding from corporate, clueless is a, wow, it's a beautiful idea because it's, it's an invitation to be still. It's an invitation to pull your mind's attention away from the things of the world. 
But if we come back to our question, what is the end game? What is the point of it all? What is not just a lesson, but what is the ultimate lesson? And Jesus says in Workbook Lesson 132, he says, there is no world, period. This is the central lesson that this course aims to teach. And not everyone is ready to learn it. Wow, those three sentences tell us a lot. There is no world, period. He has other parts, you know, there is no world apart from what you think or, but, but there is no world. This is the central lesson this Course aims to teach. There is another part in the workbook when he's talking about perception, our world of images, and he offers a word in the lesson as really what we could say is like a synonym for our perceptual world. What's a synonym for the world from Jesus? Hallucination. Wow. Now just put your little psychological hats on. For a minute you're a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and you've just been told by the awakened one, the one who has escaped all guilt, all problems, all errors, all sadness, all depression, all fear, you've just heard that he's used that word hallucination. Is not hallucination a better word? He, he kind of says in there, and he's offering that up as a synonym for perception, really. But again, let's just take it into our, our mind and be practical with that. If indeed we open our mind just to begin to accept the idea that the world is a hallucination, then the next question in our mind becomes, what then? You see, if Jesus is going to throw that word at us, then we are going to ask the what then question. What do you want of me? <laughs> what, how can I be helpful? <laughs> how can I serve? Oh, hi Jason. <laughs> and so, some of you know we have our Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. Has anybody ever seen or heard of the movie A Beautiful Mind? That's a lovely movie. Which is a, a very famous mathematician, very brilliant mathematician at a Eastern College University who progressively seems to experience what most of us call, would, would say seems to be some form of psychology model, would call it schizophrenia, where he's seeing people that aren't there. And what did we call in psychology when you see people who aren't there? Hallucination. Okay, that's a good clue. It's a good clue. So, as deep as that is, and that is deep, what Jesus is really saying, and what I've said many times, is it's a perceptual problem. Even if it doesn't seem like a perceptual problem, even if it seems like a, a body issue, a relationship issue, a financial issue, an issue with what's happening in the world, a, an issue with the politics of the world, or all the things that that seem to come up into awareness. It just seems endless, this trove of consciousness that is sending us all these images. And yet, behind it all, Jesus is saying that, that there is no world, and this is the central lesson this Course aims to teach. So, what he's really going at is he's saying that, that this is a perceptual world, and when he uses workbook lessons like the salvation of the world depends on me, he's not talking about a personality me. That would be ridiculous. Why would the salvation of the world depend on one of the hallucinations? 
know, that, that would make no sense. Even if you talk to most Christians in the world and you say, ah, I had a wonderful insight, the salvation of the world depends on me. Probably the Christian would, uh oh, we got one here. <laughs> we got one for the mental <laughs> institution. <laughs> because, because through the egoic filter, that seems probably like the most arrogant statements you could ever make. The salvation of the world depends on me. But he's not, he's not talking about our personality cells. He's talking about our mind. He's telling us we can choose again. We can choose an entirely different way of looking at the world. We can choose an entirely different way of identifying with ourself. We have the power of decision. We have, we may have denied heaven, we may have denied the power of our mind, we may have denied the power of our choice, but Jesus is saying, now the kingdom of heaven, because you believe in choice, because you believe in images and these hallucinations, you still have not lost your power of decision. Heaven is the decision I must make, is a workbook lesson. Heaven must take the form of a decision. Heaven is not in reality a decision, but for the mind that is asleep and dreaming and believes in opposites, believes in multiplicity, duality, believes in all kinds of things that, that really are not eternal in nature, then forgiveness is a decision, atonement is a decision that must be made. And that's really what our focus is. My friend Resta, one day I was at the Peace House and she would walk along in this big cemetery very nearby and back in that day listen to cassettes or uh, the early days of, of iPods, I think it was called an iPod back in those days, uh, an Apple iPod and and yeah, she was listening to Lesson 132 and she came into the kitchen. She was very frustrated, I could tell. I said, how are you doing? Not, not very well today. Well, let me make you some tea. We'll just sit down and talk about it. And then when I did make the tea and sat down to talk with her, I said, is something bothering you? And she said, yes, something's very much bothering me. She said, he's... Now he's done it. Now he's really done it. And I said, who did it? And she said, Jesus. What did Jesus do? He's, he's gone too far. <laughs> she had just heard on her iPod Lesson 132. He's gone too far. That's too far. He's crossed the line. He's crossed the line. That's it. <laughs> he's just gone too far. And and I said, well, let's just sit and talk about it. And we did talk about it for maybe 45 minutes or so. And then she went back to the bathroom to go to the little commode down the hall. And when she sat, sat down in the commode, she started receiving a song from the angels because she received like 270 some songs. And the song was As If. And it was the angels song, As If There Is No World. A cosmic dream, a made-up scheme, where figures dance and swirl, and nothing means a thing except the truth within, that I am mind by God designed. He's calling me to live as if there is no world. So when she came back, that was part of her reason she was so upset with Jesus was when I asked her, why are you so upset at Jesus? Well, he went too far. How did he go too far? She just looked at me and she said with her T, how is this practical? How is there is no world a practical statement? And I said, he's not asking you to deny the world. He's just asking you to live as if there is no world. What does that mean? Live internally. Live intuitively. Live a hundred percent intuitively. Live by inner guidance. Live by the voice for God within. Live every day, every second, by what that voice instructs you to say or do. 
until you can take your Truman Show good afternoon, good evening, and good night, and take a nice bow. Thank you very much, angels. <laughs> All of you are angels. Wonderful job. Mission accomplished. Good afternoon, good evening, good night. And so in that sense, that's the practicality. The practicality is just living a guided life. That simple. He does say heaven is, is beyond our curriculum. That's good to know. You know, when we talk about truth or heaven or oneness or divine spirit, that's actually beyond the curriculum. That's why he didn't title his book A Course in Oneness or A Course in Revelation. He titled it A Course in Miracles because miracles are extremely practical. He's saying if you knew how far, seeming far you need to go in terms of steps, that would be too overwhelming. So let's just suffice to say this is A Course in Miracles and we're going to work with training your mind to be miraculous, miracle-minded, consistently miracle-minded, and that will suffice. That will take you where you want to go. That will take you in toward a memory that you have forgotten, but you want to remember, that you pray to remember, that you pray every day, please help me remember God, help me remember the truth, and then the miracles come as practical, you could say almost little flashes, flashes in the mind that just show you everything is perfect. Right-minded seeing can see only perfection. When you're in your right mind, there are no problems. When you're in your right mind, there is no death. When you're in your right mind, there is no challenge. When you're in your right mind, there is no difficulty. And miracles are little glimpses, like little snapshots, little flashes of, of this right-minded awareness. And that's what the mind training is for. Just to give yourself over. Say, I'm, I'm just going to give myself to this. I know my unconscious mind will present a lot of objections to the goal of even working miracles. It's not what we grew up with. None of us grew up in a family where when we were kids, you know, they clothed us and, oh, I'm going to send you off to school, but don't worry too much because you're a miracle worker anyway and, you know, you'll forget all this that you're learning <laughs> at some point. Wow, if our parents had told us that, no stress going to school. We could, we could treat every Every class like recess, we could <laughs> treat every every situation, every textbook like recess. The playfulness of it, the lightness. Learn what we're drawn to be, to learn. Let go of the rest, and then allow our intuition to use whatever we seem to learn in a in a playful, happy, joyful way. To be happy, learning for happiness, not learning for achievement future achievement, there's stress at that. You know, will I reach the goal of achievement? Will I reach the status that I believe I need to reach for happiness? Will my life and form turn out in the way that, that I hope it will? And again, Jesus is just saying, you know, miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. Basically, too, the miracle just, Jesus says, the miracle does not create nor really change at all. It merely looks on devastation and reminds the mind that what it sees is false. That's pretty simple. Uh, that's a good definition of a miracle. Looks on devastation and reminds the mind that what it sees is false. Almost gets you get this image of almost like this ancient, like we'll say a, a Buddhist monk or Buddhist yogi who's been meditating for many hours, many days, many weeks, many months. And then at one point he just opens his eyes briefly, looks around, and then goes back into meditation. <laughs> looks on devastation. 
and is reminded that it's false. Ah, okay. <laughs> ah, that's enough. <laughs> Imagine that your draw into meditation was that strong, where you open your eyes after a long period of time and go, oh, thank you, that's enough. <laughs> because that, that's what the miracle is. And the miracle we could equate with healing, so we have to undo a lot of ideas and concepts about healing because our concepts of healing are really tied to and rooted in the body. And Jesus tells us in the Course, the mind was sick that thought the body could be sick. You see how deep this is. He's, he's saying it's a hallucination. And if you take your hallucination and you try to pick some bits and pieces of the hallucination and say some are sick bodies and some are well bodies, some are happy bodies, some are sad bodies, you're really not getting the point of the central lesson. Because the central lesson is not to pick and choose among the hallucinations because that's missing the point. The point. It would be like that movie A Beautiful Mind trying to tell that that mathematician, this is how the world works. Some of the people you see are real and some of the people you see don't exist. Now that's a psychiatrist, but probably a lot of medication <laughs> and a lot of work to try to t teach the mind. You can tell the difference between the dead people and the, the, the living ones, or between the sick ones and the well ones. The whole medical model is based on diagnosing the problem in form and trying to prevent outcomes, namely sickness and death. But we're learning from Jesus, it's all mind, it's all psychological because it's all the psyche. And so when you try to decide upon the form of what you want, you do lose the understanding of its purpose because the purpose is forgiveness. The purpose is to see a hallucination as a hallucination. That's how you wake up, is you're not fooled by the trick of the ego. But it's not trying to make better hallucinations. Uh, you know, sometimes people work with the Course and they think, they say to me, will the, will the Course, if I really study it and practice it, will it improve my life? And I say, well, that depends on how you define life. If you define life by your worldly persona and perception, don't count on the Course. The Course's goal is not aimed at, at improving the illusion. It's not aimed at improving the hallucination. It may seem that, that it goes that way a bit, where you do have those thoughts like, hmm, I'm doing pretty good, or I've advanced a long way, or things like this. But these are still part of the ego's trick to keep the mind from going to the wake-up point, you know, to, to be content with pretty good. There was a movie, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, some of you saw that movie with, about Dan Millman's life, and Socrates, his teacher, comes pretty far along in the movie when, when he's t working with uh, Dan, and basically he does a few things to try to, to give some contrast experiences, and finally Socrates says to Dan, there is no better. We're not any better than anyone else, no one else is any better than us, because there is not a better. And if there is not a better, you, you know what follows from that, there is no worse either. Whoa, well, that's pretty relaxing. You can feel the stress <laughs> start to go from your mind. Because think of all the stress that's just associated with the concepts of better and worse. What does Jesus say? All things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. That everything is always working together for good. From the right mind perspective, that's that's absolutely true. That's an absolute statement because from the right mind there is no error. The right mind is the correction to the error of the ego and the error to linear time. So, so again, if we come back to the basic premise, 
of if the world is a hallucination, if there ultimately there is no world, then that must mean I'm working on a direct experience of innocence, a direct experience of all is working together for the good, a direct experience of all is good. God is good always, and always God is good. You could say that about your identity. My identity as Christ is always good. God created Christ. There's nothing but goodness. There's nothing but innocence. And then this world becomes just an opportunity. You might just say, a, the world is nothing more than maybe a practice ground for doing the mind training. And so this is ultimately why as you go deeper and deeper, you start to step away from the things that you seem to do, the things that you thought you were, become not appealing. They're not appealing. They, they do start to feel more like old news. <laughs> like, uh, like my friend Dorothy, whenever anybody would present her with an issue or problem, she was up there at Roscoe with me and Ken Wapnick, Dorothy would say, so what? Now what? That, that was her simple way <laughs> of coming back to the moment. So what? Now what? You know, like don't get caught into the story. Don't get caught in the interpretation. So what? Now what? Now what? That's a very uh, practical question. What now? Now what? And And that is really beautiful because when you start to really feel this, then you start to you start to see, wow, that's what I'm going to devote my mind energy to, now to allowing the Holy Spirit to heal my mind, to becoming 100% intuitive, to, to inner listening. All pathways really actually promote inner listening. You know, that's part of all core religions and, and, and core spiritualities is inner listening. And that's why, I think, because that's the, that's the point, that's the core point of, of everything, is that inner listening. That's where the rubber meets the road, that's where the practicality comes in, when you get in touch with that guidance. Because then you can feel the reward of the guidance, of listening and following the guidance in this instant. You don't have to wait for a future <laughs> reward, you don't have to wait for it to pay off some time in the future, you get an instant reward. Psychologists uh, say the, the problem with this world, one of them is, is people are all searching for instant gratification, and this is not the same instant. This is not uh, the ego's gratification through the body. This is gratification of coming deeper into the holy instant and really living by it and f merging into it, accepting it. But in one sense, it does, uh, there's a Kenny Loggins song, uh, some of you know Kenny Loggins, he did a song called Keep the Fire. Uh, and one of the lines I like was, further and further from things that we've done, leaving them one by one. Oh, what a beautiful line. It's, it's, it's kind of going on a journey and letting the past drift away in your mind, fade away, further and further from the things that we've done, leaving them one by one. And we have just begun. The song is, oh, it's, it's called uh, Watching the River Run, not Keep the Fire, Watching the River Run. So that's really what our, our focus is, because you, you have the ability to feel what you're feeling to acknowledge what you're feeling, to acknowledge when you feel happy, and also to acknowledge when you don't feel happy, when you feel like you're chasing something, or you're looking for something, or you feel unfulfilled. That is, is an ego emotion that, that fits in with the ego, with the death wish, unfulfillment. And then right-mindedness, you might say, is the goal 
uh, the goal of atonement or forgiveness because the fulfillment is is in the right mindedness. It's not in an outcome of the world. We have been tricked into to defining death in terms of the world. We we have been tricked into believing that bodies die. We've also been tricked into believing that they're born. We've been tricked into reincarnation. We've been tricked into all kinds of concepts that still are attempts to explain the error. Even uh, reincarnation is kind of an ingenious attempt <laughs> to explain time and eternity and console yourself and say, well, I believe I'm incarnated now, but hopefully someday I won't be an incarnate being. I will just be a pure spiritual being. But there's lifetimes involved and there's lots of lots of lessons to learn, multiple lessons, but but that's still part of the the trick. It's still trying to explain the error instead of to accept the correction. So that's why this is such a deep path. It's not here to explain anything, it's not here to describe anything, it's just here to t take the mind into an experience. And also your pursuit of happiness begins to shift to more of a how do I feel now perspective than, I mean the game that I played for many many years, actually decades, was I'll be happy when. I had all my ambitions lined up after the when. I'll be happy when my life looks this way. I'll be happy when I achieve these things. I won't rest until I've achieved and accomplished this and this and this and this. And then I was I was told, good, 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 you're ambitious. And then I watched that Gandhi movie and and he was walking along with this man named Walker and they were walking along talking. I think they were in South Africa. And this uh, reporter Walker turned to Gandhi and said, looked around at the ashram that Gandhi was seemingly building and and said, uh, Mr. Gandhi, you're quite an ambitious fellow. To which Gandhi replied, I hope not. That's great. I was quite identified as an American with ambitions. <laughs> I had to pause the movie. What? What did he say? Shh, rewind. You're quite an ambitious fellow. I hope not. Oh, I hope not. There's a glitch in the matrix. Gandhi is exposing a glitch. Ooh. What if we had it wrong? What if we were moving in the wrong direction? You know, like the Paul Simon songs, slip sliding away. The nearer your destination, the more you're slip sliding away. The nearer your destination in terms of a future form, the more you're slip sliding away from your Christ mind. <laughs> Awareness of your Christ mind. Whoa, that's a 360 turn. So, and I think actually, you know, we've gone along, we've had, I, I look at our ministry even, we've had this fun, fun, fun ministry, but but now there's shifts and changes even coming within our ministry. You know, been talking about mysticism, but now I think for for some of us, um, we no longer feel the need to talk the talk or even to walk the talk, because the walking the talk involves the body too. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're ready to be finished with talk the talk and walk the talk. And this isn't like skipping over anything. This is just a natural fading away in the mind of, of a desire to focus on the body and activities and things of the world. It's just a natural draw into the stillness. And so walk walk the talk, talk the talk, yap, 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 yap. It's all the same. It and we feel like it's like a big kind of a stepping back. In some sense, it's it's like the spiritual version of, I was thinking, um, I remember for years I used to watch the Olympics and I really liked watching gymnastics. I remember, I remember the, the, the gymnast uh, Nadia Komanich. I remember when she would 
get up on the bar, the rings and the, but she'd get on the bar and she would be f f f flipping around and around and around and there and be like, wow, oh, it's a little bar and she's, <laughs> she doesn't even seem to be aware. <laughs> she's fearless. And then the judge is 10, 10, 10, 10. She's getting 10s, perfect 10 scores and everything. And I, Jesus was reminding me of, of Nadia the other day and he said, he said, and now it's time for your dismount. Dismount. Even Nadia, who got up on the bar and flipped and flipped and flipped around, and the judge is 10, 10, 10, Nadia had to do a dismount. She had to leave the bar to end the program. She She really had to have a dismount. So I, it was beautiful. I kept hearing Jesus, now the dismount. So it's almost like if the world's a hallucination and you mounted the world <laughs> somehow, you took it too seriously, you you got too involved. What's that movie, The Nines, where the blonde woman says, you know, we, we got too involved. We started, we, you, you know, you'll be back if you, you can't do it both ways. You'll you'll be counting the pine cones. <laughs> she says, if you try, if you try to stay involved with the world, you'll be you'll still be counting the pine cones. That's not a dismount. That's just another distraction. So clearly, even with our ministry, you know, it's going to be changing significantly. I mean, here we, we're. This is Living Miracles Monastery, so that's what monasteries are for. That's what, if you ask Thomas Merton, why are you at the Abbey of Gethsemane? And he would say, honestly? And you said, yeah, why are you Abbey at the Abbey of Gethsemane? He would say, probably to pray to God and, and contemplate God's grace or something like that. That's the purpose. That's the purpose of a monastery. In fact, that's the purpose of anything. That's the purpose of a city. That's the purpose of a house. That's the purpose of everything in the world is to pray to God and contemplate God's grace and God's eternal nature and gifts. And if the mind gets distracted off into other things, then then Thomas Merton would say, you know, that's a problem. In fact, he he wrote and wrote and wrote. He wrote prolifically, but he's one of the few monks that I know that basically was so devoted to his function of writing that basically he they built him a, a cabin in the woods <laughs> down on the lands in there uh, in, in Kentucky in in the Abbey of Gethsemane because um, he just he did do a lot of writing but he didn't really need to be around priests and other monks for that function. He just wrote prolifically, he prayed, he contemplated, and then at the end of his life, you know, just like Francis and J.P. took a little trip as a whim, uh, Thomas Merton took a trip uh, across to the Far East, I think it was Thailand, and where he uh, I think he stepped in some water when a fan fell over and, and he was electrocuted. And that was <laughs> But I did hear his last talk that he gave before he was electrocuted. And that's just another way of laying aside the body. It's nothing <laughs> nothing it's quick. That's very fast. Very efficient too. I think, you know, it's like he wasn't messing around. <laughs> a day without contemplating God is a wasted day. <laughs> But I did listen to his last talk without knowing that he was electrocuted because I listened to the talk and I and I had this deep feeling in my heart when I was listening to the audio, not knowing anything about how he died, seemed to die. But when I was listening to his last talk, he was so happy. I thought, he, this guy is really happy. And then I thought, he's he's saying goodbye. I felt that when I was listening to the talk. I said, he's... He's doing his Truman Show thing. He's he's about to take an exit. And before they turned the microphone off, he I think his last words were, "Let's go have a coke." It was very hot. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I even remember it, his last words <laughs> that were recorded. I thought, he's happy, he's happy, and then let's go have a Coke. And then that was, that was it. That was, that was the last talk. But, but that's important because that's a dismount. You know, you have to always be ready for the dismount. And I think in A Course in Miracles, when you give yourself over to the Course, you know the direction <laughs> that Jesus is taking you. He's taking you to the light. And, and going to the light seems to involve a dismount of the hallucination. You know, that's what awakening is all about. You have to include the dismount. You cannot skip over the dismount. <laughs> and that's what what this is about. That's what we're we're going into. So yeah, I've I've had that feeling for some weeks. I I've had people the, the ministry will seem to shift uh, this year pretty radically dr dramatically, uh, pretty drastically, I guess, in in the sense that that that's the way it was for us. When we got into this, everything in our world shifted dramatically. Then we just got used. We got used. We were in the happy prayer every day of, use me, use me Jesus, use me Holy Spirit. We were in the joy of, use me, use me, use me. And uh, Bill Withers passed away. Does anybody remember Bill Withers? He had a song called, Use Me. You just keep on using me until you use me up. Do -do 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 until you use me up. Do -do -do. Oh, that's beautiful. That's explaining the dismount. That's how you dismount by being used fully, by being used a hundred percent. You you use until you use me up, until you use mini me up. <laughs> there's, there's, there's actual me and mini me. <laughs> so you, spirit, use mini me until you use me up, until you use mini me up, until there's no division anymore between the, the Christ me and the mini me. It says in the Course, you know, it says, uh, was Jesus the Christ? And, and the answer is, oh yes, along with you. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how it addressed, was Jesus the Christ? Oh yes, along with you. He seemed to have a body that was separate and apart, walking apart from other bodies. Oh, that's a very kind of a, imagine that, getting that on your chat GPT. He seemed to have a body walking apart from other bodies, but he is you and you are him. You are the Divine Christ. You always have been, always will be. You are as God created you. Once our chat box ready, I hope it gives answers like that. <laughs> You're having a stressful day. Whew, you go in the bathroom, you come out. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> How could I have been so mesmerized <laughs> to think such tiny thoughts when that's not the truth of it never was the truth of it you know that's the joy that's the joy that we have is is the experience of of the vastness you know that's that's the point so it's interesting we our ministry was we shared so much and then there was so much travel and so much travel to so many countries and so many retreats and so many things and and who knows Maybe in the in the world of form, the beat goes on, but I don't think it will be the same. The same characters. <laughs> Some of us are. We've been watching this movie with these uh, characters for a long time, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just a feeling of of stepping back, and and then with it, just like there were those that came before us. You know, everywhere I would go when I went to Mexico, I. I met this man named Ray Padilla, and he knew this woman. I think at one point she had dated even Frank Sinatra back in the day, but she became a course stu teacher, course student, course teacher, and then she be she became like really active with the course. And then 
She was down there in uh, Chapala, Lake Chapala area before I even got there. She passed away, but I never did get to meet her. But but Ray said, oh, yeah, uh, Judy and Witt would come down and visit her all the time. Oh, well, Judy and Witt were down here, too, before we came down there. We, we weren't the first ones to bring the course to the area. We're just rolling in along the parade of bodies, the parade of bodies and hallucinations. But there was this woman, and then Judy Witt were there. They used to, oh, yeah, they would go down there frequently, maybe even annually, to, to visit her and everything. And that's what I find when I've traveled around the world to all these countries. You know, I meet people and I get to hear uh, stories of some of the forerunners with the Course in Miracles. You know, we even have some books, booklets, the Varleys, you know, starting off in, you know, back around, around 1980, late 70s, 19, early 80s, and there's just been a lot of, and there's, it, the beat just goes on and on, and then here comes the next wave, the next wave, and it's all part of Jesus' plan of of helping the mind to realize that it's a hallucination. <laughs> That's all. It's not about, it's not going anywhere in form. It's just reminding over and over how purely innocent we are, over and over that we are loved, over and over that we never could make a mistake, over and over that we're divine, over and over the beat goes on, the characters come, the characters go, the places seem to shift, but behind all of the appearances is a beauti beautiful central lesson. There is no world. <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> wow, I would have never imagined that that was the central lesson. <laughs> okay, get, let me get this straight. I came to this world to see that the world's not real. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's it. The Holy Spirit uses time to teach that there is no time. Yeah. Oh. Oh. That's a deep central lesson. <laughs> that's... A, that's not about making the world a better place. That's not about fixing the world. That's not about changing the world. Wow, what a relief to be to open up to the central lesson because then you can see where it leads to peace. It leads to inner peace because then you can let all things be exactly as they are. Then you can really just watch the world with a place of acceptance in your own mind, not trying to accept images, but just acceptance of of the grace of God. And that way also you're freed up from, from trying to figure out the world. You're you're trying you're freed up from trying to understand the world. I think that's that's been an issue <laughs> in in terms of the world is trying to understand it. Uh Francis and JP just took their seven week trip and and Francis was telling me that you know wherever she went she just I was asking her I said what was your impression she said wow lots of people are are giving their heart over to this but her main impression from traveling around was that that course in miracles students beat themselves up they take things way too seriously they they feel hesitant to make a move. They're afraid to go back. They're afraid to go ahead. They become paralyzed in the metaphysics. And then the shoulds and ought tos of the ego creep in and bring in a, like a, a paralysis. Afraid to go ahead. Afraid to go behind. You know, jo Joanne and I, we, we talked about, you know, the... Well, the ego will try to intellectualize things to prevent an experience, but but it was beautiful because Francis and JP Francis did a lot of experiential exercises, you know, eye gazing exercises, all kinds of different exercises with people to provide immediate help, you know, to come to kind of come back, come inside to an experience, which is so important, and that's the prayer of the heart. That's what people were praying for. They, they were praying to feel peace. They were praying to feel innocence. They were praying to feel happy, lighthearted, to, to be laughing, to feel joy. You know, that is the prayer of our heart, not, 
not to get sidetracked or to get taken on some kind of delay that that you go out on and you think, how did I get out here? <laughs> when, where did I <laughs> turn to get out into this aspect of much ado about nothing? Shakespeare said it was much ado about nothing, but how did I try to make something out of nothing? And then, oh, okay, oops. And then to drop it, you know, to not beat yourself up about the oops, you know, to make it a drop. So that's, I think that's really important, you know, because, um, yeah, I guess you've been, what, some of you have seen some of our improv online <laughs> uh, revivals. Andy was saying, when we were driving back from the airport, he was saying, well, we've never done anything like this. I said, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, saw, I saw the revivals. <laughs> I thought, yeah, we've never done anything like this. But I think it's, in one sense, it's a good thing. As long, <laughs> I mean, from the beginning of the idea, I thought, I thought, we shouldn't think of this as events, weekend events. This should be, um, improv is your lifestyle. Living your life improv, where you're so intuitive that you can just, in the spur of the moment, Say, oh, this is what I feel, here's what I'm going to, and you really go for it with your intuition, and then you start to feel like the whole world is improv. <laughs> your character goes from kind of constricted and constrained, to you start feeling more like Robin Williams. <laughs> he was like a, he was like a master of improv. That's why he was so funny, because he was so spontaneous. He wasn't tied in. I mean, actually, improv, that Lisa and I used to talk about that, that's the kind of shows we grew up with, with Carol Burnett, Vicki Lawrence, Tim Conway, Harvey Corman. Oh my gosh, they started off the skits, but then they they always, somebody was improv, doing improv in there. And then the others started to try to fight back laughter, and then everyone was laughing because everything. It wasn't a planned skit. I've even seen some some Saturday Night Lights live skits where someone in the middle of the skit, you know, just decides to go improv, into improv mode. And then just the look, you just see it on some of the faces of the care of the actors and actresses. They're like, because they know they have, they're live, they have to go on with the skit, and somebody's just gone rogue. <laughs> they think gone rogue with the whole skit. And then it gets, it's quite funny. Then it makes the, it definitely makes YouTube when someone <laughs> goes rogue, and then they, and then everything is funnier in the skit itself, because, because everyone's like, well, we're off the rails now, like, how are we going to do this? How is it going to end? You know, and then people get into the joy of it. Yeah. I was sharing with Frances, and when I talked to her recently, and I did a talk, how she was sharing that yeah, they were at a restaurant or something, and some brought, someone brought up this. It was actually the man wrote to me today, the man who, he said, I'm the one who, who brought up, put the, this word into the conversation. He was actually Francis's uh, translator, Erico is his name. He was asking me if he could use, he made a short clip from the interview I did with her. He wanted to translate it to Japanese and put it out. I said, oh, sure. He said, do I have permission to take a short clip from this interview? I was the one who first put this word out that you guys talked about. I don't even remember what the word was, but I said, he said, could I translate the short clip into Japanese and put it out? I said, you can translate. You can take anything I've ever done on the internet and translate it to Japanese and put it out any way that you want. And I'll give you permission for all of anything. But, but the, it just was funny because they didn't even remember how they started laughing, but they just laughed and laughed and laughed for like two hours. And if I, the punchline was, it was some kind of a word that meant some kind of a, st a style in Japanese. And it got to the point where somebody in the group said, the the actor Gregory Peck, just said Gregory Peck, and then JP and Francis, oh yeah, Gregory Peck. Everyone, 
oh, Gregory Peck. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody. And then they went off laughing for like two hours because they came up with one word or one name that kind of was the example of what they couldn't put their fingers on, this kind of style, you know. He was kind of charming. Gregory Peck, I can think of some, it was a good, but that's the way it goes, that you start to realize that, that nothing in terms of the details has ever really meant what you thought it meant, but it was all part of a plan designed to help you laugh. That the whole thing was like a, a, a comedy. Not that the, the, the hallucination was the comedy, but the perspective that you have on looking on the hallucination is makes it a comedy. In that sense, it's a divine comedy. Because it's there's a laughter, there's a gentle laughter of the Holy Spirit underneath it. Like, ah, oh, isn't this fun watching it this way? You don't have to take it seriously. Nothing was what you thought it was. You were never harmed. You were never mistreated. You just thought you were. You were never, you were just mistaken about the perspective on the hallucination. But you were not the victim of it. You were never the victim of it. You are now totally returned to your empowered mind and delivered from the hallucination in, in this miraculous way of looking at the world. So, that's, that's good. That's my spiel for this morning. <laughs> But do we have a a microphone? Yvonne has a microphone, so as usual we can open it up to everyone. <laughs> Whatever anyone wants to talk about. <laughs> so something that's been on my heart the last few days and this question and you were actually talking about it not placing one illusion for a new one yeah and what I've been feeling lately is it's this tiny fear of like I have placed like I took away the Bali illusion that dream for now it's spiritual community and everything here is so like there's all these shared agreements and functions and we take it very serious and all I know is I want to follow Jesus and I want to do whatever he wants me to do. But I'm not mind trained enough to find that sweet spot of knowing like, I don't know, like how do I know I'm not just having a new illusion and making it... Hmm. Like, yeah, I want to use those symbols to wake up, but I think that's just this fear of like, yeah, how do I know that I'm back in the mind and I'm not, I don't know, everything seems so real. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it makes sense what I'm saying, but I just, I don't want to put my happiness in own out spiritual community that's going to bring me happiness. I don't want to seek in the form any longer. Um, Yeah, I think that's just mm -hmm. the prayer I like to, to know or something. Yeah, yeah. It's I I know when I traveled around the world a lot uh, one of the when I would talk to people people sometimes would come up and hit course gatherings and say I know the world's an illusion but <laughs> and then they would <laughs> go on because and I would listen for a few minutes and I would say well maybe maybe you need to flip that around is I believe the world's real and <laughs> Uh, is there anything helpful <laughs> to help me deepen and find inner peace that lasts forever? That's a way of flipping the, the sentence. Because they would start off, I know the world's an illusion, but, and then I would say, well, the but <laughs> contradicts the first part of the statement. You know, it, it's, it's not really a, a true statement. It's not a declaration. But, but I think that is, uh, back when I was doing those all-day movie workshops, 
I actually showed Brother Sun, Sister Moon, and I actually went through the stages of the development of trust in the Manual for Teachers, very deep. There's like six stages. But if you look at those stages, you can see it's almost like a little bit of a roadmap of starting to realize that at every stage, when you think you know something, you don't. And then, the, and then he'll say, the teacher of God has not come as far as he, he thought. And think little, it's like Jesus giving a commentary on these seeming steps that are very practical and I think are very helpful. But, but what it is, is the mind seems to go through these stages because it's still not clear on, on Workbook Lesson 133, I will not value what is valueless. It's still, it still can't make a, 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 a good discernment call on bet what is the difference between the valuable and the valueless. Because human beings can't make that distinction. Only the Holy Spirit really knows what's valuable and what's valueless. That's why he's the comforter. That's why he's the, he's the answer. That's why he's the, the inspiration. He's the instructor. <laughs> the instructor can tell the difference between the valuable and the valueless. But what Jesus is really teaching us is you, you can't make that distinction as a person and you have to be willing to expose and release the belief in sacrifice. I know a lot of course students and teachers from around the world that will say, oh, those damn Catholics, all the sacrifice shit. I was raised with all this Catholic sacrifice shit. I said, what are you now? I'm a recovering Catholic. Okay, I'm a course student, but I'm a recovering Catholic. And they said, those damn Catholics with all that sacrifice died for our sins and the blood of the Lamb and this and this. And I'm like, no, it's not the Catholics. It's, it's in the mind. The ego itself is the belief in sacrifice. Wouldn't, isn't that, that shouldn't surprise us, that the death wish itself is the belief in sacrifice. The death wish inserted into Jesus' teachings, the, the opposite of Jesus' teachings, which is sacrifice. But it's so buried and so hidden in the subconscious mind that as you seem to go through this journey as a person taking steps, it's still down there. And, and then you go from one situation, one scenario to the next, and then you, know, you, you, you were in Denmark and you, you had a job and career and family, friends and this, and then you did the Bali step. And then I talked to you when you were in Bali and that's a big step seemingly in the world from the life that you had there to, to Bali. And then the step over here and then to community and back and forth with Mexico. But, but really everything is more just to pray, listen and follow of, of tuning in, merging with the Holy Spirit to, to come to a point of seeing the impossibility of sacrifice. That's really the end game. That's, that's what the right mind is, is the right mind is the impossibility of sacrifice. And the ego is saying, oh, oh no, sacrifice is a reality. You see, they, they differ completely on this, on what's real. And so, even when you make steps, the, the fear can be like, I, I don't want to substitute one illusion for another, but as long as the belief in sacrifice is the mind, then that's exactly the way the ego set it up. <laughs> that you'll just go surfing and you'll just jump from one <laughs> scenario that's an illusion to another scenario that's an illusion, and then you'll be thinking, was that a good jump or not? Did I, <laughs> did I make the right jump? Did I take the right step? You see, it, it's, it's the unconscious belief in sacrifice that brings the question, that brings the struggle, that brings everything. You know, I, I've, I've heard people say crazy things over these last you know, three decades where they say, well, if everything's an illusion, then, then nothing matters, and then I should be able to do every, anything I want. You see how it is shifting from 
this miraculous state of mind that sees the false as false to, oh, if everything's an illusion, then there's no consequences. We we like that movie Groundhog Day because Phil, the weatherman, keeps reliving the same day, and after a while, he's like, he starts to feel like nothing matters. So he just kills himself over and over. And this could be like reincarnation, when you kill yourself over and over, seem to, in many different ways, and then you still find yourself back reliving the same time loop. And then, and then Groundhog Day is a good movie because it's only when uh, his producer Rita says, I don't know Phil, maybe, maybe there's another way to look at it. She's literally speaking The Course in Miracles right in the movie. Maybe there's Phil, maybe there's another way to look at it. And then from that point he starts to look for how he can give and share and extend. You know, he's fixing the flat tire for the ladies, he's going, he's doing the Heimlich maneuver, he's, he's going around and he's helping, he's increasing his helpfulness. So, you know, I think that's the way it's kind of gone for you in your life. I think, I think in one step sense, Bali was kind of a, a step in the direction of, of really going inside and finding your heart, finding your heart song. And then now all the steps are more for expansion and in, increasing the helpfulness, and feeling more in that vibe of, of just giving. And also understanding that it's not in the form. So, you know, as you approach that, you know, you still there still may be other steps that the Spirit inspires you to, but it's all for just expansion and coming more into that expansive state of mind and seeing the impossibility of sacrifice. Not that you did sacrifice and now you're not, but just the impossibility that you ever, you were just mistaken to think that you could had to sacrifice to know who you are, or had to sacrifice to know God. That is that is the the key thing that's underneath. And though it's good to review those, uh, those stages of development of trust from time to time, because that's kind of the feeling you get when you read it. You're like, oh, it's all is well, and the Spirit's got this, and it's only, it's, in, it's inevitable that I will accept that sacrifice is impossible, because it is impossible. <laughs> it's, it's actually a fact that there's no sacrifice. But the ego always is trying to chirp away, you know, like, was that a good move? Did you just substitute one, <laughs> one, one thing to another? We're interested in getting past the idea of, of differences even, that things could be better, you know, looking constantly to for a better situation, a better scenario, not wanting to make one person, place, or thing special, because as soon as we do, there's a feeling of like dependency. Like, oh, now I've, now I've chosen this. Uh, almost like the old ideas of karma, you know, what is your karma? To be such and such and such, you know. No, John Lennon handled the karma issue when he did the song Instant Karma. Instant Karma is going to get you, going to knock you off your feet, you know. Better recognize your brother, everyone you meet. Why in the world are we here? You don't have to live in pain and fear. And why in the world are you there when you're everywhere? Going to get your share and we all shine on the moon and the stars and the sun. We all shine on. Everyone. Everyone. Thank you, Apostle John. <laughs> Our modern day <laughs> Apostle John Lennon. Just in case we missed the karma lesson, he makes a song called Instant Karma. That's the end to karma is the holy instant. He was kind of channeling Jesus' holy instant, saying, you're not really stuck in this ego game. You know, you any instant you can be set free. You don't, and, and he's not even encouraging us to delay. <laughs> he's, he's encouraging us to, to go for it, to keep expanding, to keep open, you know, to 
realize we never did anything wrong or right because we were just completely mistaken about our identity. It t it's stress free, you know. It, it's it's a hallelujah. That's <laughs> the Leonard Cohen song. We finally come back to the hallelujah. I think Enya did a song too. Hallelujah. Ha, ha, hallelujah. I like this song. The chorus. Ha, ha, ha. Her hallelujah sounds like ha, 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 ha. Ha, ha, hallelujah. She's got a good song too. She's almost poking fun. But she's using that hallelujah to, to keep the ha, ha, ha there, you know. That's the greatest, the greatest feeling. So thank you. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good thank question so for much. freedom. <laughs> thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, we should never get take anything too serious at the monastery. We, if if it gets too serious, it's you, somebody should say pajama party. <laughs> you know? We actually have had some really fun pajama parties over the years. Yeah, we play music. I remember one time we did a retreat here, and it, it was like maybe a week long retreat and everything, and. And then right at the end of the retreat, you know, people were getting ready to leave and everything, but uh, I I went into the kitchen and I decided to play DJ. So I got on my, my phone and I started playing one song after another, and I don't know, whatever song came to my mind, but there were a lot of of dance songs. and. I remember, who was it? Armel and Ricky and Deanna were on the sink dancing. They were on the sink as I played dance song, dance song, and they were just up. That's That was like not taking it serious. We just poured our hearts into doing a whole week-long retreat, and it was very deep and a blessing for everybody, and then it just we were so relaxed that it turned into this dance song, and I think they, somebody filmed it. So there's some somewhere, probably Nicholas have it, has it in the archives. People started getting phones out and filming it because I remember, yeah, it was those three dancing. They were all dancing on top of the the granite, uh, yeah, thing. Sweet. And we've had that actually. That happened quite a lot. Where where we've just Things have just broken out. Sometimes we're in a restaurant, sometimes we're out on a walk. This was here at the monastery, you know. It's just joy, it's rapturous joy that just comes in and everybody is just looking around and just get into the joy of the moment and marveling in it. And, and it's all a backdrop too. I mean, we have used many, 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 many projects over the years in all different kinds of ways too. But I think they were actually really just a real good backdrop for communication, you know. The the tendency in the human condition is to is privacy, is is keeping things to themselves. That's the that's the whole that is what sickness is, is sickness is the belief in private minds and private thoughts. So it has nothing to do with bodies. And death is the belief in private minds and private thoughts. So it actually has nothing to do with bodies. It's just projected onto the bodies. But it's the death wish, the belief to be separate from God, the belief that seems to be buried in the unconscious mind. That's, that's what needs to be raised up. And, I mean, throughout the monasteries and convents throughout history, you know, they of course, I mean, if if you if you didn't live in a monastery or a convent or whatever, then then you notice it's it's like entropy. Did you ever notice that everything in the world is breaking down and falling falling apart? Everything that's that's the gift from science that entropy, the cosmos is moving towards destruction. The linear cosmos. Okay, well then you seem to 
carve out bits and pieces of things of like bodies and cars and houses and everything. And you notice that the bodies and the cars and the houses are are subject to entropy. The the ecosphere is subject to entropy. Nothing is black holes are <laughs> <laughs> are subject to entropy. Nothing is not subject to that entropy. So we have um, we have some pretty dark philosophies that have arisen over the centuries, like existentialism. You know, existentialism is kind of moaning about the entropy. <laughs> That's kind. <laughs> I know that's probably going to end up on Facebook as a quote from me. <laughs> and everyone will go, what about Sartre and all the... I'm not interested in the people. Entropy, existentialism is just moaning <laughs> about the entropy <laughs> of the world. <laughs> Let's get deeper here, come on. <laughs> Let's go down deeper. Let's not try to break it out and philosophize and figure it out. Okay, let's just come to it. It's okay. It's entropy, but it's a hallucination. That's good. Isn't that bright? It's a hallucination of entropy. So, the spark, it's keep the fire bright, keep your purpose bright, keep your heart open, keep, you know, uh, what's that song, Amanda Cook, may we never lose our wonder. Let's keep the wonder, let's keep the wonder alive, let's keep the spark alive, because that inner spark is not subject to entropy. Isn't that great? That's a hallelujah, that our inner spark is not subject to the entropy. And meanwhile, there are things, while we believe in time and space, that, and things are always breaking down and falling apart and breaking down, um, it's, it's not that big of a deal in terms of like even with, we know that about houses and cars and bodies you know, they they seem to, on the timeline, they seem to, you know, break down. But but we're not really feeling it's our calling to be, to subject our mind to that entropy. Like, okay, we made it up and now we can forgive it. We made it up in the mind level and we can release it. We must be able to release what was made up. We are not stuck in the entropy, you know. We must be able to change our mind about it. So, so I think that's the, that's the thing. And that's why I think it, it's like you can start to just relax into the guidance and the flow of the day knowing, oh, this is a day to help me open my heart up, connect with my brothers and sisters, to learn how to communicate. That's what I've seen over the years is, is Really, the problems are not what they seem to be. We think the problems are in the form. But it's just our fear of communication. That's the problem. <laughs> we have a fear of communication. And why do we have a fear of communication? Because we have a fear of the light. And why do we have a fear of the light? Because we are afraid of love. And why are we afraid of love except that we still believe in the death wish? You know, we're, the ego is afraid of love. And if our mind identifies with the ego, we feel its fear. So it's really, we're feeling the fear of the ego for communication. The ego likes isolation, separation, uh, private minds, private thoughts, secrets. Okay, yeah, that's that's its game. And and our new game is forgiveness, which is letting all things be used for connection, for joining, for communication. I've never seen that over-communication is a problem. Every time it always comes down to it's under communication, and the reason there's under communication is because there's fear. That's why the mind under communicates. I can handle it on my own. I don't need to talk to them. I don't need to talk to you. Know, well, really, if you talk to them, I think it'll go a lot better. But I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> it's like, but over the years, you know, you start to realize, ah, oh, it's all a backdrop for 
communication, you know, getting deeper into the communication. So I find that delightful. I mean, not at the beginning, I was like, I was very shy. So I was not the over communicator. I was the, the shy, 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 shy. Uh, back in high school, my sister, my biological sister, she was voted class clown of her senior class and I was voted most quiet of my senior class. But when I got into the course, there was little lines that used to jump out at me. And one of the lines that I really liked, because I was afraid of communication, was Jesus said, the willingness to communicate attracts communication. I didn't know what that meant, but I liked the sound of it. Wow, the willingness to communicate attracts communication. So that was the preceder of me <laughs> traveling all around the world and doing all these talks and gatherings, which is kind of funny, you know, Moses stuttered and he had to deliver the Ten Commandments <laughs> and I was mis voted most quiet and I tur turned into a spokesman for Christ. But that's the fun of it all, you know, you see it's just a willingness to be used, like that Bill Withers song, you just keep on using me till you use me up. The willingness to go in that direction, which was actually the opposite direction from my personality, very opposite, it was just, okay. And then after a while, it starts to feel more natural. Oh, I liked communicating. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, that was great. What a blast. This is not the shy guy speaking. This is, wow, what a blast. What a blast. Oh, it was all for healing my mind. Oh, it was all for opening my heart. It was all for, for opening to the vastness of, of what's available. That's what it was all for. It wasn't for anything specific. It was for a purpose much, much greater. So that's, that's the gift of it all, you know. We could just take one line from the Course and if it just grabs you and jumps out at you, and of course for someone who was shy, the, the, the willingness to communicate attracts communication. That did get my attention, I have to say. I did say, I don't know what that means, but I like it. <laughs> kind of like it. What was that movie, uh, The Island, where uh, the, the, what was the, male, the main character, the man, Ewan McGregor, sees a motorcycle when he's stand, he comes out into the, the like the Matrix, <laughs> and he sees a motorcycle go, go by and she says, what was that? He said, I don't know, but I like it. <laughs> we, we have to have that same kind of feeling, you know, to, to go out of our comfort zones based on the past, to go out of our inhibitions, out of our restrictions, out of our limitations. And we don't even know, have to know fully where we're being taken into. If we already knew, we wouldn't need this world. So we must need to expand toward the light. And we know that the Holy Spirit is to do it for us, and all we have to do is to want to do it. Really, that's our part. We get the guidance, ah, oh, this could be very helpful. Do you want to? We have a choice. Yeah. I mean, at the beginning, you can't really, I, I did not fathom speaking. I, I, I could not fathom that at all. But I could just barely fathom traveling. That's how Jesus got me, got me, hooked me into my function, like traveling. It was a little spooky, it was a little scary, but it was doable <laughs> for me <laughs> to go out and travel. And then I traveled a little more, okay, oh, okay, okay, it's going all right, it's going good. Now I want to speak through you, ooh. <laughs> You speak, woo! <laughs> My parents told me never talk about God or politics. And, well, we're going to talk a lot about God. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> that's the spooky. But you see, you go, go, go. You keep going, expanding with what what feels intuitively helpful. Yeah, and don't stop until you're used up. <laughs> 
you're not trying to retire from the world, you're trying to do a dismount in your mind. <laughs> the, the Nadia coming, now the dismount. And she lands with two feet on the ground. Ten. That's a ten. That's a perfect routine and a perfect dismount. That's a ten. <laughs> ten out of ten. Yeah, that's what we're going for. Yeah. Joe. Hi, David. Hi. <laughs> so good to see you. Um, yeah, I, um, I want to talk about the body a little bit. Um, so just a little like backstory is, you know, I, I was in Michigan for a while and I'm studying the course very intensely doing the lessons and I got done with the lessons and I just started them over again. So like two years of just really going inward and practicing it. And, and what I've noticed is like, I, I feel happier. <laughs> I'm getting happier and happier. And every encounter that I have, it, it feels like I'm, it, it's supposed to be there. I'm just enjoying meeting strangers and having these beautiful, like, encounters. Um, but I feel like my, like my, like the ego is really switching to viciousness when it comes to my body. I have past trauma with surgeries and stuff when I was a boy. And um, yeah, it's, it feels like it's easier, becoming easier to forgive and allow the external. And I realize the body is external, but it just feels like when I'm really, I really been practicing praying to Jesus, like I'm very, very curious and loving just starting a dialogue with Jesus in the morning and especially at night and um, saying just use use this body use and then at night just thanking the day <clears throat> but yeah it just feels like when what takes me out of the moment or takes me away and is these like you know this meat puppets getting older and it's like I'm, I feel these pains and I feel like something's happening from a surgery from a while ago when I was 14 and now it's something is happening. I feel strange pains and it goes away and it comes back and, and just other weird things in my body. And when I, and then when I feel this, I try to just stop and uh, it feels like the practice for me is just keep turning in, turning in. And when I, I notice my mind when it starts, it'll go for the past of trying to find the solution in the world to fix the body. Just many, many years of trying to eat right, and um, so it's this 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 battle kind of going on. Um, and when I, I guess, I guess my question is like, how do I? I want to, how do I pray to, or how do I ask spirit or talk to spirit in the sense of like, I mean, I've been doing, when I feel a pain in my body and it just feels strange and I have stomach cramps and I don't know what is going on. And I'm always like, you know, spirit, I, I don't know what this is, <laughs> you know, please, I don't know what to make of it. Uh, but it, it just, that seems like it's been my my struggle. That's the hot topic in my life right now. And you know, I've I've pulled out of Michigan and a safe job and all this, and went back to Hawaii I've been living a very quiet life there. And then the feeling to come here. And I re even remember a year ago talking to Kirsten, where it was this very joyful, spontaneous of coming here again. And then I was like, Yeah, that sounds amazing. And the pains come right in. You know, as soon as you make a decision to go towards the light, it was like, Okay, now I'm gonna you know, put all these weird pains in your body. And um, I mean, I can even remember like getting to the point where I was feeling some pains come and go. And then um, I felt, you know, no pain there for a while. But then I was like, um, I'm going to, I made the decision to quit my job, you know. And I told my boss, 
And uh, I said, hey, I'm, I'm going to move. I'm going to move back to Hawaii and pull out of Michigan. And they were supportive and everything. But the next day, <laughs> the next morning, the pain come in. It was kind of like almost showing me my mind, you know, all sickness is mental sickness. But it's like it seems harder. It's so personal with the body. I'm seeing like it's the central dream figure is, is very potent right now for me where it's seeing how that's playing out and um yeah but i still decided to come you know i still i'm just like i don't care <laughs> i'm just gonna do it you know i'm just gonna go for it and and i think there's a fear of 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 you know when the pain comes it's like the hypothetical future comes in and i'm trying to solve or thinking of what if the what ifs come in Am I gonna have to have surgery again? What is this gonna? What does this mean? And uh, yeah, I think spirit. <laughs> yeah. <Ooh. laughs> uh, yeah. So. <laughs> I wish that, that YouTube of, uh, of Jason talking about a surgery coming up that he had. <laughs> I can't even watch that without crying. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's just a really deep topic. Yeah. And uh, I just, I don't know if you have any thoughts about it. I just, all I know to do is just keep turning it turning in yeah it's it's like the this spiritual awakening is like a like a, a a welcoming of the spirit to like rinse our mind of of old thoughts and old ideas and it turns out in the end that that all of our thoughts about time and space are our old thoughts and old ideas that's why jesus says the world was over long ago and you're you're simply looking back on it, mentally reviewing what has already gone by. So, so the ultimate issue is a time issue, and, and yet that, that can be too vague, like, oh yeah, I've heard a lot about the, the now and the present moment, but it hasn't made a significant change, these, these thoughts of the past, surgeries, things I went through, and all the medical model, the causations, if you don't do this, then this will happen to you. It's not, if you don't do this, then that will happen. If you don't do this, it's it's a world of hypotheticals. It's a world of huge seeming potential choices. And then we're told some have very dark negative consequences, you know, that you, up, oh, you chose wrong, and then look at this. Well, you paid the price, you know, cause and effect. It, it does paint a picture of a world of sacrifice like, um, Sacrifice, pain, suffering, sickness, death, mixed in with a bunch of other things that are supposed to offset all of that, that never really do. They're not, they, we never have anything that offsets all of that. So, it's, it also is a time thing, and, it, and the reason it's a time thing is because that the, the present moment and linear time can't both be true. You know, the holy instant is a gift from God, and linear time is a, a make-believe projection of, of the ego. One's true, God, and spirit, and reality, one is not. And yet, all of the learning, all of the conditioning from all these years has, has been about this false cause and effect uh, model in the mind. If you don't do this, then you'll hit, then this will happen. And this happened, and now look at the consequences of that, that happened when I was 14, and you know, it just goes on and on. That's just the way the world, the world thinks. The solution starts to come with just what we talked about, about being intuitive and guided, and that's where your prayer is, you know. You're just praying at the beginning of the day, and you're praying at the end of the day, and basically what Jesus is saying is, just try to get into the habit of giving those thoughts that you are facing when they come up, give them to me. Why? 
Why do I have to give them to you? Because because Jesus knows they're not true. That's a good first start. And, and he says that when you don't give them to me, you claim personal responsibility and ownership for those thoughts. You think that they're your thoughts. And then you, and we believe they're your thoughts. And then you're caught into the vice of the ego because those aren't your real thoughts. He tells us throughout the workbook, you have real thoughts that you think with God, and then you've got this thick fog, this layer of, of ego thoughts that you believe in, and then you perceive what you believe. So it's kind of, it's kind of a tight vice of false thoughts and false perceptions that seem to reinforce the false thoughts. And that's not surprising that throughout all the centuries, even though Advaita Vedanta and non-duality goes back many, many centuries, they're not seen, they're not even close to being mainstream ideas. They're still, even in this day, with Eckhart going on, talking, and all the, and Ajishantis and myself and all of them talking, they're still not mainstream. You know, if you talk about these thoughts in the mainstream, you know, it's, oh, you, you believe in woo-woo, you know, and uh, Marianne Williamson runs for president, she's the woo-woo candidate. If the Democrats, Republicans, Marianne, oh, woo-woo. <laughs> you see, not acceptable in the ego's world. This is not acceptable in the ego's world. This is woo-woo. It's dismissed immediately as, as woo-woo. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, almost like, I don't, I don't, even, I don't want to be around that people. No, I don't want that. But, but what you're talking about is this is like undoing the the false cause and effect ideas in the mind and they're all based in linear time every every profession in this world when you go to the university is is very deeply rooted in the belief in linear time and even you have aspects of professions like in science you know quantum physics is is a turn away uh, or the way we're attempting, Andy and his team are attempting to use AI, that's trying ultimately using AI to teach there is no AI. <laughs> using time to teach there is no time. But that is the way the ego works, you know, it's, it's, it's counting on a very strong body identity and then it's using that false identity to induce fear, to actually to increase fear. So, how do we turn it around? First step, of course, is, is having to really be attentive to the mind and give the thoughts over to Jesus. Second thought comes to mind for me is that things involving the body is, are what Jesus calls magical. When Jesus is talking about magic, it's not just medicine, it's it's food, like the Aborigines and the Native Americans, you know, they didn't have separate categories for food <laughs> and medicine, because they used the food, oh, oh, you need to eat this, you need to have this, you know, they, they more of a holistic view of things, not seeing, they didn't have divisions of natural medicine and <laughs> medicine, or food and healthy food and unhealthy food, the Aborigines would think, that's the craziest, stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> healthy food and unhealthy food, what, who made that up? <laughs> the Aborigines would be like, that's, that is warped. Because they would, they were very much holistic. Everything you put into your body has to serve a purpose. Everything you th you do has to serve a purpose, you know, even when they would do the walkabout. That was for a purpose of like a connection with Source. It wasn't just to prove they can hike around without a home. <laughs> it had a much bigger purpose. It was for, for the, their connection with Source. So, so in one sense we're unwinding and, un and dismantling from these ego beliefs and thoughts. A false cause and effect. And Jesus is using the forms of the world, so we could say surgery is, is a form of magic. 
and changing your diet is a form of magic. And things like consciously thinking about exercise, needing to exercise more, that's magic as well. Uh, because they're all part of the hallucination, they're all made up. And what Jesus is saying is, just be willing to let the Holy Spirit use what you believe in to unwind your mind from the ego. You see, it's not a leapfrog approach. It's not just, okay, that's it, cold turkey. You're going cold turkey on the ego this year because Jesus knows that the sleeping mind is heavily invested in the ego. So, so you might say the guidance, that's why we were saying become 100% intuitive, is just follow the guidance, be very intuitive, and and start to look upon your brothers, your sisters, and everything in the world in terms of following the guidance. Not that there's an, a, a they and them and good ways and bad ways and right ways and wrong ways. It's just starting to come back more to the simple ways of thinking like the Indi indigenous tribes and the Native Americans, the Native Indians in different countries, the the Aborigines in Australia, you know. It's funny that that they don't usually make much in the history books and then they're they're kind of like the Aborigines are, are looked at as more of strange, freakish, uh, you know, like they're not related. The people don't relate to it. You know, they don't they don't really teach that in the history books. They certainly don't get into the, some of the ancient teachings of of the connection to God. It was I think last year I even was was using the the different types of psychedelics, but but psychedelics themselves, you know, are, are seen by the world as drugs. But if if you look more at the cultures, the ways the shamans use them, the ways the native cultures they they were part of their pathways to God because of their holistic thinking. They were just starting to think holistically. So really, what you're praying for is to shift more from this fragmented belief system and fragmented way of looking at the world and yourself to more of a, a holistic view. It's interesting that these kind of tribes and, and peoples are are pretty much dismissed as uncivilized. It just shows you how arrogant the ego is, you know. The ones with all the the wars, the pollution, the fighting, the just road rage, and on and on and on. Those are the civilized ones. Those are the civilized ones. And then the ones, the Aborigine, the Native American, and, and their little teepees, and walkabouts, and everything. Oh, Woo woo, woo woo. You see, so the the fragmentation is put on top, and then anything that would teach. You know, when Marianne Williamson first ran for president, you know, they the press had a field day. You know, I even watched a clip, a video clip, where she went on the comedian Bill Maher's show, and he started to say, "So you, this was more recent. This is." preceding this second run for president. So you actually study a book called A Course in Miracles. He, yes, yeah, yes I do. And there it goes, you know, on, <laughs> it's, here we go, mainstream touches on woo-woo, and it was a comedian, albeit, you know, that's how Jesus does it. But, but this, these kind of teachings are seen as, as esoteric, as, as hidden, uh, you know, you hear stories of Dead Sea Scrolls and, and things getting burned over the years <laughs> by the church or by different different groups. And and it's almost like it's it's so hidden and so few. What what we're doing now, we have, we have the course online, you know, <laughs> we just put out so much stuff. We're taking all the hidden stuff and we're, hey, hey, hey. And then what do we get? Woo-woo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. Some things don't <laughs> change, you know, it's still seen as woo-woo from the world. But when you come back to your mind training, you just have to start to just be willing to let everything 
be used. I mean, I always tell the story of um, this woman who came, I think I was in maybe in Michigan, and this woman, so, or maybe the Great Plains somewhere, I was doing a gathering, and I before the gathering started, um, I kept hearing from Jesus, wait, 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 and they were ready to start the the gathering with me and everything, and I said, wait, 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 and it was a, with a course group. And I kept hearing, wait, wait, so I, I waited, waited, and then finally, a woman came in the door five minutes late, and she was a course student, and had been a course student for a lot of years, and she actually had just come from the hospital, and she just was diagnosed with a terminal illness. And she was just heartbroken. And she came in, and she's finally, I, I could feel when she came in, everything kind of, the energy she shifted in the room, and then we all just kind of got quieter and settled down. Then she began speaking, I just came from the hospital, I was diagnosed with this, I can't go home, I can't tell my children, I can't tell my husband, I'm supposed to have a surgery, and all these things, it's just, and so what I, what came through was, well, the, the backdrop of everything that you just talked about is just a backdrop of what you believe you are, and the Spirit will use all of it. You know, the Spirit is not anti-anything in the world, it's just, they're just symbols that the Spirit can use. But when we plug those symbols into the ego's thought system, everything gets serious, super serious, because it's all just death, and fighting off death, and and what could come back at you, and what would, you know, what could happen to you, and it's just all very dark and everything. And I remember telling her, you know, no, this is your opportunity to just pray and be guided, and, and if you go to that hospital, you are going to the hospital for one reason, to be the light of the world, to be a bringer of light to everything and everyone, everyone you meet, all the nurses, all the doctors, all the staff, in the parking lot, in the parking garage, you're you're going for one reason. That's why you've been studying the Course, that's why you're on the spiritual journey, is to shine your light. It doesn't have any purpose other than shining the light. This is all for you to shine the light. But these are your props. Don't take it personally and don't think you failed. That's why she didn't want to go home and tell her husband. She said, if I go home and tell my husband this, he's going to laugh in my face. And so are my children. And I said, well, you have a purpose that's more important than any of that. And you don't have to protect these ideas or defend these ideas. You just have to follow that inner guidance and step right through whatever is coming to you so you can be the light of the world. You know, bring the joy, bring the happiness, bring the lightness. And and she was completely, by the end of the meeting, I knew that's what the whole meeting was for. She was she was lit up, she was ready to go jump into the next step, but she was taken away from that kind of cause-effect, kind of linear view into, oh, I've got a very important function here. And and that's, of course, that's what, what it's all about. I remember with my friend Resta, because Resta was, had lots of different aches and pains, come up and we were traveling one time and she was having some some of pains come up and everything and she said I just see it He's, Jesus is giving me a little symbol that every time a pain comes up it's like the ego is running a flag up yeah. the flagpole and asking me to salute <laughs> every pain it's the ego running the flag up do I have your allegiance um Salute, please salute. And you have to decide whether to salute or not the flag. You know, do I give this over to Jesus and say, I don't know what, what this is for, but please help me. I can't know what this is for. I give up all my thoughts and ideas surrounding it. Or if you salute, that just is saluting the linear false cause and effect uh, whole paradigm, uh, the whole belief system. And that's that's how we develop faith. You know, every little time when we don't salute, you know, every single time we don't salute, we we build our faith. We're, we have more faith in 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 our intuition, in the the guidance. Turning in 
it's like almost like ego pokes me just like you just said the flag and then it's a call for me to either look out or go in yeah every moment every moment it's outer in outer in do i look outside because that belief system is telling me watch it something could go wrong something is going wrong you know or do you go inside and ask for the 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 meaning ask to learn how to forgive ask to keep the faith yeah it's always the same yeah it's very different because it's not like anything we've done in the world. It's the complete opposite. Yeah, it's the complete opposite of that. And even as I said in the earlier, there's some of us. There's maybe five of us stepping back in the in the ministry, really step back, 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 back away from things that we've done and so forth. But but there will be those stepping in, stepping in. It's just symbols anyway. Why not? Let the Holy Spirit have some fun. Let Jesus have some fun with the symbols. Are some of the symbols uh, magical? They all are. They're all magic. People say, oh, I'm not going to take medicine. Well, do you wear a coat in the winter? Well, yeah. yeah. But, I, but I, <laughs> I don't take Tylenol. But you wear a coat in the winter. They're both magic. <laughs> yeah. They're all all of the symbols are magical because the ego made them all up. The miraculous view of all the symbols is what we're going for. So if these are the, this is our theater, we'll call it, the theater of the mind, then we really need to keep that in mind and, and just say, use me. You know, I, I know when I started traveling around, I was going to all kinds of countries, where I didn't even speak the language of the country. And some, I remember when I first went to Argentina, Resta said, you're going to have a big problem when you get to Argentina. I said, what? What's the problem? She says, well, for starters, <laughs> you don't speak Spanish and they speak Spanish <laughs> just for starters. I said, I don't think that's going to be a problem. And, and where are you, you going to stay? I don't know. Not a problem. And it was all orchestrated. There was 14 translators that showed up. I did basically 19 gatherings in 19 days without arranging anything myself. It was all arranged. And the airfares were, were you know, all, we were flying at Hecutiva first class, and it was all, all the flyer miles were donated. I met all these people in a country I'd never been to in my entire life. And then it, it just was, it was the Holy Spirit's use of magic. Meaning, the world of images is the magic, and the Holy Spirit has got to use it to convince my mind that I'm not it, that I'm not of the world. That's the way it works. But if I try to go back to that cause-effect thinking that I learned growing up in my family from the ego and 10 years of university, that's not a that's not going to be a happy story uh because in that framework it never goes good it it always it always ends bad in that framework 100% of the time you know it never ends good but the perspective is is always good it's always freeing so that's why i train my mind to go back to the perspective and then even with this ministry there's there, if you have five, we'll say, stepping out, and and the ministry itself, you know, then then there's others that will just seem to accept their part in the prearranged plan, like Ellen Shuckman heard at the beginning. People, she heard before there was a course in miracles. She heard people are being called from all over to take their part in a in a in the plan of of awakening. And it was basically called a celestial speed up for the good of everyone. Oh, great. So, even with the ministry, the ministry doesn't mean anything per se. The community doesn't mean anything per se. It's just, it's just, you know, it's an illusion. It's another, it's another illusion. But is it something that Jesus is using to loosen me from my identification with it? That's the key. That's the key always, you know. That that way you don't you don't get caught into fear of outcomes, you know. 
I I'm happy for the dismount. You know, people can say, "Is your ministry better or worse after all these years?" I I don't believe in in this. <laughs> I I have no opinion on that <laughs> concepts, better or worse. Uh, I th I see that it's all worked together for good. I I think of people like Billy Graham. You know going around and sharing the message of Jesus on all the, going to Russia and all these countries and round and around and around. I'm like, well, it, it's just the Spirit's, Jesus' use of, of sharing these ideas. You know, ideas are strengthened as they're given away. So, I never thought it was, any, I never thought to be an evangelist or I never thought to to even be a spokesperson for A Course in Miracles or Jesus. That was never my goal. My goal was was peace and love and happiness and connection. And then the rest just kind of filled in and came in. And I do feel like that's, we're in a it's seeming transition now where the, yeah, the community, the, the ministry is shifting and changing. Well, you've seen the improvs, that's... <laughs> <laughs> What was the skit where they Wick Jackson Rickwar? <laughs> I was like Jackson Rickwar, and oh, he's been working with David for years, and levels of mine. <laughs> but but everyone's having fun, you know. That's the main thing. That's the beauty of it, because it's it's so profound and it's so deep. But there has to be a lightness and joy and playfulness with it, because that's the whole point for us not to to take anything seriously. And and I think the things that come around the the body and around the pains, you know, that that seems even we're learning that there's no order of difficulty in miracles and there's no hierarchy of illusions, but. That's that's one that the ego tries to. It's almost like it's ace ace card. You know, it's trying to pull that one up all the time. Like as soon as you commit to come here or to do something that you feel in your heart you want to do, then the ego, I call call it ego ego backlash or ego whiplash. You know, it's of course it's going to marshal, try to, it, to get its symbols to say, oh really. Yeah. You're going to do that. Well, here about take yeah. that and take that and take that and yeah, we've yeah we've seen plenty of that over the years. Because I I feel like I'm getting happier. You know, I'm each moment is happier and happier, and then it's like it's doing this card thing. You know, it's yeah. like flying the flag. Yeah. <sighs> just allow everything just to happen and. Forgive each moment as it comes. Yeah. Yeah, there's that word that is talked about a lot of times in Christianity, really in a lot of spiritualities and religions, called temptation. And I like Jesus' definition of temptation. He says, what is temptation but the wish to make illusions real? So really, that's what temptation is. It's the wish to to take the error seriously and to somehow that's the ego's plan to make the error real every time there's a blame or a projection or why did you do this to me or i don't like what you just said to me or and, and all the forms trillions and trillions of form underneath the i remember the shakespeare line uh, methinks thou protest Doth pro we we think doth protest too much. We could say that of the ego. <laughs> oh, little ego, me, my mind thinks doth protest too much. Like the whole world <laughs> is a, is a, a, a like it's trying to protect something or blame somebody or protest. It's a protest. It's an inner protest that seems to be put out onto the screen as, as a problem. And then it has to try to make the error real. It has to say, there are medical doctors that back this up. There are studies in Harvard and Yale 
You see how it, oh, it's going to use everything to try to make the error real. It's going to try to use every bit of false evidence appearing real, fear, <laughs> false evidence appearing real, to make the error real. Because as long as it can make the error real, then you won't question your identity. You you won't say, am I really this way? You know, that's just something the ego can't stand. The ego said, well, of course you're this way, and, and you're sad, and you're sick. You know, it's going to try to, to denigrate, it's going to try to put us down. That's what all beating ourselves up is, it's just ego thoughts. And we just have to stop, hop off that treadmill and just say, no, I don't. I'm not going to uh, engage in that. Mentally, I, I, I will not engage in that. We're choosing faith, we're choosing the miracle. So, yeah, you can see what the mystics and saints have gone through. You know, they, they left us some writings, and uh, people like Richard Rohr and, and others have, have dug into those writings, and, and they basically have, have have pointed to it's that we have to look at the world differently. We need more of a holistic, broader, cosmic way of looking at the world. And then they're also helping us reinterpret the teachings of Jesus toward more. Now we know the Course is all about its perception. We all have to be like inner, inner philosophers, inner psychologists, inner doctors inner gurus. <laughs> we have to become inner experts at mind training and and releasing these ego thoughts. Because that's that's our function now. You know, and the and the salvation of the world depends on <laughs> on us accepting our our function. That's such a holy function. You know, I mean that's what's happened over the years. I've told the story where I think um um, Nicholas's father called me and said, my son Nicholas is thinking of giving his whole life over to this search for God or this serving God. And he's actually thinking of like joining your community and tossing away, you know, education and, and his whole life. Everything. I said, I said, yes, isn't that noble? <laughs> <laughs> He said, really? <laughs> he, he said, do you really think it's noble? I said, oh, absolutely. I can't think of anything more helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and yeah, he did. And Nicholas did go for it. But see, that's just, that's just following the prompts in your mind to, to expand. It doesn't have to take any particular form. You're, you do want to expand. And you do want to let Jesus use the symbols. Oftentimes, you know, I would be traveling around the world to countries I didn't speak the language and going all over, I don't know how many, 44 countries and all these different places. And I would just be sitting in some country, I didn't know the people, I didn't know the language and everything like this, and just starting to say, wow, okay, I'm going to really enjoy this moment. I don't even know what's going to come. Uh, where I'm going to stay, where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do, but I'm really going to just enjoy this moment. So in one sense it was me, it was my mind letting go of the past learning, which is, oh, I've got to figure it all out. Figure out the transportation, where am I going to stay, where am I going to sleep, what am I going to eat, all these things. It, took, it was kind of a leap of faith to just say, hmm, Jesus told me to Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all else will be added. I said, I guess this is all the, all else, and sure enough, it was everything, everything came. Even this monastery, you know, if they told me when I was in high school that I'd be sitting there in the body, seeming sixty five years old, giving a a talk at a monastery in rural Utah, Living Miracles Monastery. What are, what trip are you on? I, my God, that's wow! You have a great imagination. I would have said at eighteen years old. That's that's a really vivid, wild imagination that you have. But in one sense, it's like when we give it over to spirit, we then we can accept what comes, and and it's really quite glorious. You know, I always feel like there's been so much expansion with all the miracles, and so much some really vast experiences that, that came from just trusting. You know, 
and and then even when things would seem to fall apart based on my past learning, I would just learn to just pause a moment and say, okay, I'm just going to pause here. And then things would reconfigure or something would happen and I would end up laughing. And I would think, how interesting. One moment I'm so serious and the next moment I'm laughing. Hmm. What was What intervened? It was, must have been a miracle because I was so convinced something was going wrong and really nothing was going wrong. And then I, I could start to laugh more at that. So I, I think it's beautiful that, you, that you've come here. I also think that, that the ministry will continue to be used in, in amazing, miraculous ways. And it's just that some of the faces will, will shift well, like they always do in this world, you know, it's, and, and sometimes people find themselves doing things that they never, I, I never saw myself doing anything that I ended up seeming to do in this world. I, if somebody showed me a, a, a video of the future David, I probably would have just freaked out and run <laughs> as fast away, said, Where, that is trippy, I would have just, and, and got out. But actually, no. Now I could I could watch the whole, all the reels with a big smile on my face, like oh yeah, you know, with an appreciation, like the old Bob Hope song. I had that coming to mind, with thanks for the memories. Da, 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 da. But then underneath that is more like thanking Jesus and the Holy Spirit for the use of memory. It's not thanking for the specific memories, it's more a thank you for using these memories to loosen my mind from the ego. That's really what the gratitude is. So you go from being grateful for people, places, things, to just grateful to the Spirit for providing a way out, a, a, a healing, an actual healing that's in the mind. And that's what you're doing right now, you know, and the ego is, does. You're just really going for it, and the ego is kicking and screaming like, yeah. like, like it's spitting nails. You know, it's like, it's, <laughs> it's just really upset <laughs> that that you're made making a turn in that direction. Even, yeah, it's the way it goes. This too shall pass. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been a delightful <laughs> morning. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad. It's a big swirl. So maybe, maybe I can meet with you and Susanna now. Just, we'll, we'll kick right into, you just keep on using me. <laughs> Till you use me up. Da -da 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 Until you use me up. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> I remember the lyrics in that song. Somebody is is telling the main character in that song about this person is using you. And then that's that's his answer. Like she's using you. Well, if I'm being used, you just keep on using me until you use me up. <laughs> the guy is not buying. <laughs> They're trying to rip down his girlfriend and he's like, I don't know, just keep on using me. And of course, when you aim it to the spirit, wow, that's the answer to everything. Yeah, there's no, there's actually no questions when you get into to that willingness to be used by spirit. You know, that's like the prayer of the heart. Whoa, we've got the, the mother load. <laughs> we got the, we found the answer. Yeah, we found the joy. Yeah, that's good. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm glad we could share this together. That's been a, a treat. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs>